All right, so let's um, go ahead and read Matthew 5, verses 1 through 12 again. And then we'll focus on verses 5 and 6, um, the next, actually the, the third and the fourth of these eight uh, Beatitudes. Uh, this is what we read beginning in verse 1. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Well, again, may the Lord bless his word to our hearing uh, this evening. Now, I've already told you, and if you were here this morning, you already know this, but we began looking at uh, the Beatitudes. But before we did, we noted just a few things, and I just want to go over them again quickly so that we know how to look at these, these qualities, at these characteristics, what it is that Jesus is actually saying here. Uh, the first thing we saw is that these are actually describing for us Jesus because he was and he is this kind of man. And it's really only this kind of man that can inherit the kingdom of heaven. Now, these Beatitudes also describe, because they describe Jesus, the work that the Spirit of God is doing in us to make us more like Him. And that means that we can see these things also as the marks of God's grace. And what I mean by that is the evidences of, of, his, of his having saved us. When we see Jesus being formed in us, we know we have the Spirit of God. We know He's working in us to make us more like Jesus. We also saw that all these things come as a package and not individually. It's not like one pops up at one point in our lives and then you know, several uh, years later another one pops up. Uh, we have them all together if we have any of them. Uh, and we really don't truly have any one of them if we don't have them uh, all together at the same time. Now we do recognize that we're not going to have them to the same degree that Jesus had them because he was filled with the Spirit of God above measure and was perfect in absolutely every way. But if we have the Spirit of God, we will have these qualities, at least in some degree, we will be something like Him in every area that, again, that these are referring to really in every area of our, our lives. Now, we also saw that these qualities, that having these qualities uh, isn't the end. It's really the beginning. Uh, he gives us these things so that we can pursue these things. In other words, giving us the desire to be poor in spirit or making us in this way gives us the ability to pursue uh, those qualities even more. So we are to work hard at growing in these things. Even as Paul told us in our meditation this morning, we are to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the Spirit of God has clothed us with Christ, but we need to, at the same time, put him on, which is simply to say, growing into the image of Jesus, sanctification, growing in holiness, growing in love, requires effort on our part, but it's an effort we can do because we have the Spirit of God. Now, we saw that these blessings are connected uh, the blessings he promises are connected to these characteristics or these qualities. To inherit the kingdom of heaven, to receive this comfort, to inherit the earth, to ultimately be satisfied in our pursuit for righteousness, 
These are the things that Jesus has earned. They all have to do with his kingdom. These are his rewards. And when we find these Jesus-like characteristics in ourselves, and when we see ourselves growing in these things, Jesus is telling us we can know that we are blessed. Not only because we're becoming like him, not only because these things show that we belong to him, but because belonging to him, we will inherit these particular blessings. We will inherit the kingdom of heaven with the Lord Jesus. If we are his brothers and sisters, we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And then finally, we step back to look at the larger picture that the Beatitudes are actually teaching us here. And it's teaching us a very fundamental principle that we have to bear in mind at all times because if we go astray on this one, it's a pretty serious error. And that is that God's grace always comes before obedience. He gives us the ability to obey. We would never be able to obey God's law in the way that Jesus tells us that we must obey it if we are to enter the kingdom of heaven. Remember, he says our righteousness has to be greater than that of the scribes and Pharisees. It won't be and it can't be unless the Lord, first of all, does this work in our souls. So we need to remember that obedience does, does not earn the kingdom of heaven. It never does. It only shows that the kingdom belongs to us because we are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ because of what he is doing in us. Jesus earns the kingdom and he gives it to us freely. And when we receive it, it's, again, he does a work in us to transform us into the image of his son. And that's what this obedience is really all about. Well, after seeing that, we began looking then at what the Spirit of God is doing in us through the first Beatitudes and by way again of, of um, review, first of all, he's working humility in us. It is those who are poor in spirit that will inherit the kingdom. Jesus was humble. Jesus being God humbled himself to take on our nature to become a man. He further humbled himself by becoming a servant to us even to the point of laying down his life for us on the cross, taking the curse that was meant for us upon himself. Jesus served us. He humbled himself to become the servant of all, which is why he is also the greatest in the kingdom. The Spirit creates the same quality in us. He humbles us for our sins to bring us to Jesus. He humbles us further so that we might serve each other and those outside the church. Remember, in the kingdom of heaven, humility, being a servant, is something that Jesus prizes. He tells us that it is the one who is the servant of all that will be the greatest. The one who stoops the lowest will be exalted to the highest position. And that's what he wants us to strive for. And we can do that because the Spirit of God is working this in our souls. Now, we saw, secondly that it's those who mourn over sin that will have the comfort of knowing that their sins are forgiven. Unless our sins actually trouble us, we're never going to come to Jesus to begin with to be freed from our sins. And unless the sins of, of others and the consequences that we know they're going to have to face for those sins, unless those things grieve us, we're really not going to reach out to them. Now, we know Jesus didn't have any personal sin to grieve over. He was absolutely perfect. He never committed any. But we also saw that he did mourn the sins of those around him. And he did what he could to reach out to them with the gospel. Now, this evening, we're going to consider two more Beatitudes, two more of the characteristics that Jesus had. Uh, verse 5, blessed are the gentle. And verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And again, if you're a Christian here this evening, you already know something of these things, but we, I think it's helpful to, to learn a little bit more about them, kind of fill out our understanding so that we know what it is we are to be aiming at. Now, first of all, Jesus says, blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Uh, the word means to be meek, kind, considerate, mild, of a friendly disposition. 
uh, to be likable, to be approachable. Uh, again, the idea of gentleness. Uh, one further thing that Ferguson noted about the Beatitudes in general is how they are the exact opposite of what we find of those that, that's in those who are in the world. And I think we'd have to admit that that's absolutely true. Uh, just backing up to the first one again, are the people of this world humble? Well, that's not the way that the, the Bible would characterize them. And if you remember what you were like before you came to Christ, I think you would know that isn't the case. By nature, we come into this world being proud. Uh, we don't want, or when we came into the world, we didn't want to serve others. We wanted them to serve us. We wanted to be on top rather than on the bottom. You know, again, the, the world and the kingdom of heaven are different. James tells us in James 4, verse 6, that God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble, which is why, of course, the Spirit of God makes us humble, that we might receive God's grace. If he didn't, God would oppose us. We don't want God to oppose us. Uh, they don't grieve over their own sins. They don't grieve over the sins of others. The people of the world might be sorry if they get caught doing something wrong. They might feel a, a twinge of guilt in their conscience, but they're never grieved that they have offended God. And when they see the sins of other people, I think more often than not, they're comforted by how others' weaknesses and faults make them feel about themselves rather than being sorry for what it's going to do ultimately <clears throat> to them. Now, the fact that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of Satan, uh, that those who are in the different kingdoms are, are so opposite shouldn't really surprise us. The Bible represents the kingdom that the people of the world are in as a kingdom of darkness. And the children of God in the kingdom of light, light and darkness are as opposite as you can get. Uh, their father is the devil. Our father is God. Now, there is a sense in which God is the father of all men. We understand that. But since the fall, the people of this world have, as Jesus told the Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil. And the devil and God are as opposite as you can get. So we shouldn't be surprised that the kingdom of heaven will be the opposite of the kingdom of this world. Now, the same is true with regard to this particular beatitude or, or quality or characteristic. Those who belong to the kingdom are gentle, again, kind, considerate, have a friendly disposition, while those of the world are actually just the opposite. Let me just, let me just say this because we need to understand this in order to make sense of, what, of what's being said here. Uh, the people who are in the world are the opposite of the people who are in the kingdom of heaven. Even though it may not appear that way, we do need to remember that the Spirit of God is at work in their hearts to restrain their sins so that they are not expressing or being what they might otherwise be apart from the grace of God. And the reason why the Lord does that, the reason why He restrains sin so that they become nice and, and good neighbors is so He can continue to do His work in this world. There is going to come a time when those restraints will be taken off and that will happen when a person dies apart from the Lord Jesus. And when they are in hell, then they will experience more of what they really are. But in this world, they are restrained. But what the Bible says about them is true, though restrained. As Paul tells us, there's none righteous, not even one. There's none who does good, none who seeks after God, and so forth. The people of the world, rather than being gentle, are harsh, certainly can be cruel, inconsiderate, and reserved with regard to um, uh, having this friendly disposition. They're more withdrawn. Now, again, we would see more of that if it wasn't for God's mercy and grace in restraining it for our sakes so that we can live and do what the Lord calls us to do in this world. Now, again, this describes Jesus. If there's one thing that stands out about the Lord Jesus, it's certainly his gentleness. Now, Jesus was not, he, he was meek, 
but he wasn't weak. And we do need to understand that meekness is not referring to weakness. No one could accuse Jesus. They might accuse him, but they couldn't make this accusation uh, stick of being wimpy or powerless or weak. I mean, read, read the, uh, the Gospels. He's the one who made that whip and drove all these thieving Jews out of his father's house, out of the temple. Uh, he's the one who rebuked the scribes and the Pharisees publicly to their face for being hypocrites. He's the one who willingly gave himself into their hands to face all their hatred and all their abuse that he might save us from our sins. Jesus was not weak. I think we only wish we had this kind of strength that he had. And we do have something of it, but not to the degree that he had it. So he was weak. He wasn't weak, but he was meek, kind, gentle, and considerate. Jesus was not intimidating. He wasn't harsh. He wasn't condemning, but he was welcoming. Now listen to what he says in Matthew 11, 28 through 29, a very uh, familiar passage where Jesus is calling sinners to come to him. He says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Now, Jesus was easy to approach, which is one of the reasons why we came to Jesus. Uh, we knew that if we came to him, that he would not send us away empty-handed. Let me ask any of you here who have come to Jesus and trusted him, did you find him to be harsh, or did you find him to be gentle? And do you find him continuing to be gentle with regard to you, how he leads you, how he forgives you, how he helps you, how he is continually ministering to you, doing what is good for you in order to help you on your way to heaven. Jesus is the good shepherd who cares for his sheep. Now, Jesus is telling us here that this is the grace the Spirit of God is working in our souls. He gives us the same gentle disposition so that we too will be approachable, so that others won't be afraid to come to us to learn more about Jesus. Uh, you know, this is really one of the things that people look for when they, when they come to a church. They look for love. They look to be welcomed. They look for acceptance. And believers and unbelievers, but just think about believers. For believers, it's one of the signs, I think, that the Lord is with this particular people when they see this kind of love. Uh, Jesus did say in John 13, verse 35, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That love that they see in us is, is again, an indication that the Lord is with us. As I was thinking about this, I couldn't help but think about years ago when Don and I were looking for a church, and I think we had visited many, many churches. Uh, during that time, we visited one of the most unfriendly and unwelcoming churches that we had ever seen, and really even to this day, because when we were there, nobody greeted us, nobody talked to us. Uh, when the pastor who was standing in the foyer as we were on our way out saw us coming, he turned his back to us. Um, now, sadly, that was our first experience in a Reformed church. And when I mean Reformed, it was, it was literally historically a Reformed church. And um, since that time, that particular denomination has had problems, so we're actually glad that we had that experience there so that we wouldn't end up, have ended up perhaps in that particular uh, denomination. But from our perspective, they didn't seem to care whether we were there or not there. And so feeling somewhat alienated, we decided not to return. Uh, the point is, if we are to be effective in, in reaching others or in ministering to those around us or in ministering to those that come to us, we need to have this kind of disposition that Jesus had, a gentle and welcoming disposition. We need to be approachable. They need to know that we care. Now remember, the gentleness is not a weakness. Gentleness is a strength. It's the ability to be kind and considerate 
even to those who are not. Uh, it's, it's really another aspect of love, the love the Spirit of God puts in our hearts to make us more like Jesus. But like these other qualities, even though we possess it, it's something we need to strive to grow in, strive to put on. Uh, Jesus said on one occasion when he was speaking about the last days before his judgment was going to come on Jerusalem in 70 AD because of their rejecting and crucifying him. Uh, he said this about what was going to happen in those days in Matthew 24, 12. He says, because lawlessness is increased, many people's love will grow cold. Now, lawlessness can have that kind of effect in, in any generation. And the, the, the evil, the inconsiderateness, the harshness, the, the wickedness, the sin of those around us can tend to have the same effect upon us. It can make our love grow cold. And I think for me, the, uh, the, the illustration that I see of it virtually every day is when I get out on the road with my, with my automobile, with my car, and I see the way people are driving around me. Now tell me that the people, you know, the way people drive around you doesn't affect you. It doesn't affect how you drive. There are a few people that, that seem to be unaffected by these things, but uh, when somebody, you know, wants to zoom past you and get ahead, he won't, won't let you, you know, won't let you get ahead. He's always going to be first. Does that affect you? Or if he cuts you off, you know, cuts in in front of you, there's maybe one car length, but he somehow squeezes in there, even though you're wide open behind you, He's got to get in front of you. That kind of inconsiderateness, which we meet with every day, can have the effect of making us want to be the same way. Now, that's just a mild example of all the things that are going on that can actually cause our hearts to harden. We need to resist. We need to resist letting our hearts become hard, our love growing cold. We need to resist returning evil for evil. But the Lord says we need to do good instead. Be the considerate, the gentle driver, the kind one, the one who lets people in, the one who's going to let the other person pass, the one who is just going to accept whatever happens and you're not going to get upset about it. We need the grace of God to, to do this, not just in that area, but in every area. If we are to become more like Jesus, that's what we have to do. It's the only way that we're going to be effective in ministering to others. And let's also not forget the blessing that's attached to this. Again, verse 5. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. When we have this Christ-like gentleness in our lives, we know that he is being formed in us. We know that we belong to him. And we know that we're going to inherit the earth along with him. And I think what Jesus means by that is not this old earth that's being corrupted by sin, but the new earth that he's going to bring when he makes all things new again in his eternal kingdom. We will inherit the kingdom, which includes the new earth that he's going to create in that day. So blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. And then secondly and finally for this evening, Jesus says in verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. When we think about the idea of desiring what is right, how strong should it be? Well, it should be like hunger and like thirst. We all know what it's like to feel hungry. When you're hungry, you feel like you have to eat. Or when you're thirsty... You want to quench that thirst. It's a strong desire. Jesus uses these things as an image of how strongly we should want to do what God tells us is good and right in his word. He says not only how strong the desire should be in this passage, but he's actually telling us how constant it should be. Uh, he says literally, blessed are those who are the continually hungering and thirsting. There's a particular tense in, in, the, in the original language in the verbs there that uh, talk about the different kind of action that's being referred to by, the, by these verbs. And in this particular case, the tense reminds us this is continual, not just a one-time thing and not sort of like a 
repeated thing, but a constant thing in the present. We need to be constantly hungering and thirsting. Ultimately, to be like Jesus, because he is the perfect example of what God calls us to be. Now again, think about what Jesus was like in this regard. Jesus said on one occasion that doing his Father's will was more important to him than his necessary food, than, than eating, literally. Remember when the disciples returned with food from the Samaritan city? They came to Jesus, saw he had been talking with a woman, but she went into the city, and then they urged Jesus to eat. But then we read in John 4, verses 32 through 34, but he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples were saying to one another, no one brought him anything to eat, did he? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Now, this is what Jesus was hungering for. Doing this is what satisfied him. It's what quenched the thirst that he had in his soul, pleasing the one whom he loved the most. Now, if there, if, if there was any one secret, we might say, to Jesus' productivity, I think it was this, his desire to honor his Father, his continual hungering and thirsting to please him, kept him continually moving forward to do the will of his Father who sent him into the world. Now, again, that is what the Spirit of God is actually working in us. The desire to be like Jesus, to move forward in furthering his goals by creating within us this hungering and thirsting to be like him. This is really the reason why we read the Bible, why we want to read the Bible, so we can learn more about Jesus, what Jesus is really like, so that we can put on his character not just imitate him outwardly, but also inwardly. And so recognizing the things in our lives that, that are different than Jesus, that are contrary to what we see in him, uh, we can put those things off and put them to death. It's also what makes us read the Bible to learn more about what he wants us to do and, and how we are to do it. It's, that is, is what moves us uh, to do this. The Spirit of God working that image of Jesus, that hungering and thirsting after righteousness, after what is right. But again, let's remember that even though we have this desire from the Spirit, like the other qualities we've seen, we are called to grow in these things. And we grow in them by putting off the things that are sinful, by doing what Paul said this morning in Romans chapter 13, making no provision for the flesh, don't leave any room for lusts, uh, but put on Jesus in his entirety. And of course, the way we do that is by reading the Word of God, but also by getting that source of power that Jesus promised us, being filled with the Spirit of God. That's why he poured his Spirit out on Pentecost, so that we might be more like him. The more we have of his Spirit, the more we are influenced by the Spirit, the more we're going to want to be like Jesus, so the more we will try to be like Jesus and the more we will become like Jesus. His presence strengthens all of these qualities. So if this desire is in us, along with humility, grieving over sin, and this gentle spirit, and if it is growing, it shows that we belong to Jesus. And because we belong to Jesus, we're not only going to grow more into his image and his likeness here, but one day we are going to be just like him. One day our desire is going to be fully satisfied. Now, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness because they shall be satisfied. We will be satisfied when we enter into heaven. Our souls will be perfect. All our remaining sin is going to be removed. We won't want those things anymore at all, period. And we will bear his image perfectly. In that day, we will love as Jesus loves. We will love him. We will love his Father. 
We will love the saints and the angels who will be our companions throughout all eternity. And we will love them with the fullness of the Spirit's love. What we have now is just a taste of what we're going to have then. Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Now, we're going to look at the remaining Beatitudes in, in two weeks from now, Lord willing. But for today, let's remember, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who uh, are gentle. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness or for Christ-likeness because they are, we are, if that's true of us, we are the heirs of, of heaven. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we, and ask the Lord to apply these things to us and, and that we might remember them and work to grow in them.